comes up to learn what their primary look is. A lot of times teams will warm up what they want to be able to do in a game. So they might be running an end zone. They might be working on in their four lines drill. They might do a cut where they go up line and they open up the inside to do those little inside shots. You can learn a lot about a team by how they warm up. What are they looking to practice? So that's just another little trick that I use. So that way, if I don't have a lot of info on a team, I can learn um, little bits there. So we talked about offensive flow, creating chaos, um, where they might get it from certain players, handler movements, deep game, seven cut and system. And then finally, one of the things that I really love doing is ultimate becomes a chess game in a lot of those uh, big games. Coaches have tendencies. So when you're talking, thinking about in-game adjustments, can you stay ahead of the other coaches' adjustments? Coaches have patterns just like players have patterns. And if you can learn a coach's pattern, you can stay ahead of them and be able to then create opportunities as they start to make adjustments as well. Um, one of my um, favorite games is coaching against Ohio State because I'm such a fan of Deanna Ball and I've watched her so much that I love it because it feels like a chess game to me because I try to stay ahead of her adjustments. I feel like I know what she's going to do. And I work with my defense, think of the strength of my players and maneuver what they're gonna do because I feel like she's gonna adjust what I just did. And so being able to understand not only what you're coaching against in terms of players, but what you're coaching against in terms of other coaches to be able to be dynamic with what you're trying to do, not only with the chaos and confusion that you're making on defense, but also like potentially how you can get your offense to settle into their flow. Um, so with that, I just talked about how I approach like overall, kind of want to open it up to if anyone has questions about anything I said. You could also put them in the chat if you'd like. Oh, is there anything in the chat? I just see yours about like asking people to donate. No, I'm telling other people that they can. Oh, okay. Oh, defense. So you've spoken a lot of how defenses adjust to offenses and it makes a lot of sense. Well, thanks. Um, what are your thoughts about offensive flow adjustments? If your offense is struggling, how do you adjust? That's a great question. So one of the things I really like to think about is Offense and flow is a level of comfort. So thinking about utilizing practice time to develop that comfort. A lot of times as a coach, when you're able to walk on the line and say, we've done this and we've done this a lot of times, um, kind of gives that calm and that swagger to a team. Uh, one of the skill are things that I've done with teams in the past um, that I really like doing is actually creating a menu in terms of things that make us successful. We did this um, in 2018 with a team that I coached, and I actually made a mock disc of what I did with the, this team. So we had kind of four major principles or three major principles of our offense. It was attack and create space, switch the field, and our red zone. Our fourth principle was track on slay, which was a defensive principle. And we had these discs on the sideline, and as a coach, if I ever needed to settle the offense, I would kind of empower the players and say, hey, which thing do we need to do better? And we had practiced these a ton of times. We knew the nuances of attack and create space. Players knew their roles in terms of how to settle into those things. And so if uh, a player was just like, I really think we need to attack and create space. And you're just like, yeah, let's go do that. And then just get them excited, get them to settle into what's going on. Also being able to talk about potentially what the other team's taking away, being like, they're doing a real, they're poaching in the deep space. Let's really work our unders. Um, one of the tools I'll use cues on the sideline. If you ever watch video of teams that play where I'm coaching, you'll hear me just like do a gentle cadence of as many as it takes, as many as it takes. And I'll say that and I'll do that in games where we are winning and we're being successful. So when we're doing it in games that are tight, um, people stay relaxed. And sometimes a hammer over the top for 40 yards is as many as it took. And I trust my athletes to work through and trust that. And I know one of you are on here, so that agree with me on that. Am I right, Annalise? Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, that's a great question. Thank you, Nick. Hopefully that answered it. And I really like using um, the menu. Do you have ways of helping the team get better at making adjustments? You can have the right idea, but how do you create a team that has the ability to make adjustments? Uh, that's a great question. And we're gonna talk about that in utilizing your whole team to be able to do that and talk about how you can teach at practice how to do those types of things. Um, so yeah, unless there is anything else. So I'll get to that um, in the last one in terms of how I teach defense and how I teach offense. So that way you can make adjustments in games because a lot of it comes down to what you do at practice. If you can, just like this menu, if you can understand everything that goes into attack and create space, then when you're on the field, you already have the muscle memory. Um, all right, so practicing it as a skill. So one thing that I do in terms of coaching is I watch film and I coach that game or I sit on the sidelines and I think of what adjustments and I try to identify kind of what is happening on the field. It's a fun game and it's really, really great if you can do it with other people that are also kind of um, in the same space of you that you can talk out loud and be able to process it because they might be seeing things that you're not. And that's really important because if you can start building a Rolodex in your mind of certain types of players, um, certain types of offenses, um, certain types of defenses, then you're going to be able to be able to catalog and pull that quicker. So this is still in the frame of you being able to identify um, and being able to identify quickly is really important. If you can identify quicker, then you can give adjustments quicker. But if it takes you five or six points to understand what a team is doing well, then it's going to take, you're not gonna be able to give that adjustment. And sometimes those adjustments take time to develop and be able to do it. So the faster that you can identify and the quicker that you can process, the more time you're giving your team to implement. And that's really important um, as a leader on your team to give your team time to implement. Um, the other thing I like to do is to practice this skill is I build drills at practice to be able to attack space with the offense um, and see if I can set up scenarios where I can then create confusion with the defense. Can I get the defense to think about, um, can I basically coach against myself? If I give the offense saying that, they can huck it and they get the disc back on hucks. Um, does the defense adjust? And can I basically give an advantage to one team that's like they're learning to be able to dial in their deep game and the other team knows that that's what they're going to want to do. And can I like basically build that aspect where we can make that harder on our team? Um, when you can kind of coach against yourself and also raise your own like skill level, just like in players, when you're going and like matching up against your teammate, you're making each other better. Can you give adjustments to each team and can you make yourself better by coaching against yourself at practice? Um, I talked a little bit about creating a Rolodex of players. This is something you can do as a athlete on the field. I have spent a lot of time kind of cataloging in my mind shapes that players make in terms of how they throw almost like different release points and also the cadence of how different players move, not only with the disc in their hands, but also with how they move on the field in terms of cuts. And then I can then look at someone and go, oh, they move like this person and I can then get there faster. I can be able to just kind of identify by almost like in my mind thinking that they're almost like a mirror and be like, oh, they're a little bit of player A mixed with a little bit of B, this is how I would coach against that player because I've spent time thinking about not only in my play when I've taken matchups on the field, how I would neutralize somebody, but then I can then take, think about it quicker and then give my athlete time to implement. That helps me also as a player become a better defender um, to be able to think about how would I neutralize someone with my strengths. Um, so yeah. That is kind of how I practice that skill. Any questions about that? Because the utilize your whole team is going to be a lot more in depth. So I want to give time to that. Mm -hmm. 
you mentioned uh, recognizing offensive strengths quicker. How do you attempt to do that when the offense keeps adjusting their strategy and starting offense? Exactly. Vert on one point, side stack on another. Um, that's a great question. Um, that is kind of like dynamic offenses. And a lot of the times you can look at which players tend to play which one. So you can actually look at handler sets, like be like, which handlers tend to go out on vert stack and be able to think through that. There's actually, um, there's a game that when we were playing is I would, I was lucky enough that my uh, head coach Molly Moore would call the lines and I could listen to uh, Jason Adams calling the lines and I would know, oh, okay, this is the type of offense I would run against those seven players. And I would just sit there and listen to what he was saying. And I started to identify particular players and kind of what they would do and what the strengths of those players were to then be able to neutralize that offense. So in terms of like ones that are dynamic, what can I do in terms of that? Is it certain players? If it's different systems, a lot of the time systems are attacking similar things and there's similar similarities in terms of maybe how they run their handler set with their initial handler. What can you do there? Or maybe, um, you run a junk for a second and <laughs> take a time to think that could also be something that you can do to slow them down and give yourself an opportunity to think about, okay, how am I going to handle that they're running different systems? Um, hopefully that, <laughs> had that helped. If I didn't answer that, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, Oh, another way to do that that I really love to do is you call an audible on the line that you call like I don't sometimes I'll have like a defense where I'll call it a zero, meaning that I'll call the force in the middle of the air. Or you'll have a D1 where the first half of the field you're doing something and the second half you're doing something else that you'll call and being able to mismatch D's and, and actually in that tra transition of your defense from maybe going to a saggy offense up front in terms of the handler into something tight. A lot of times in that transition, it creates confusion. So if you can't identify which offense they're going to run and what space they're doing, can you actually create the chaos yourself by having some sort of transition? So that's something else I love to do. That was a great question. All right. Woo. In terms of applying that chess game to practice to prepare teams for in-game adjustments, how would you address a situation in which one line has consistently had more success or just dominates the other? For example, um, oh, just doesn't feel the D-line's pressure at practices despite the adjustments due to skill, athleticism, chemistry gap. Um, well, I'd say that's a bigger question. I tend to think about how I can make lines that are um, – as strong as the other, because if I can keep my defense on the field, I'm just gonna continue to rack up points and I'm gonna make my old line as strong as I can. So that way that I know that they can hold. And I see that there's different strengths from the different lines. So I tend to not have O line and D line with that gap. I tend to have players that are trending one way or another. And I would build drills around um, being able to have like mix and match of players. So that way I wouldn't have that and all like ships rise in terms of people getting better. Or you can do a scrimmage that we did where every time you score, you lose a player on the field. And so we told the athletes that they had, they had to play person, but anytime you scored, you dropped a player and they got promoted to being on the sideline and helping from the sideline. So we actually played six v seven and we worked on being able to hit players and so yes there was person and there was one poacher in the lane and we went down we actually think we started with 8v8 and went down to one team got five to be able to promote that idea of like seeing space to be able to challenge as many as it took trying to flow through something so that's something that we worked on um, when we were kind of putting together lines that might feel that disparity um, if a team is consistently beating you in the deep space, when would you implement an adjustment in the handler space with a straight up mark versus downfield with last back help or both? Um, so I, it depends on how they're beating you in the deep space. So are they beating you in the deep space because they have a thrower that's very good? Are they beating you in the deep space because 
they have a particular athlete that's very good. So that would actually depend a lot on how they're getting that off. Is it a systematic thing where they're going to huck it regardless? If they're going to huck it regardless, you teach your team to get back and just like send help, push them under that type of thing, get behind them because if they're going to huck it regard, like no matter what, we're going to be there and we're going to have as many of our jerseys under that disc as possible. Um, one example is there was a particular team I've coached against who had a unbelievable person in the air. They, they were probably the best in college at that point in time. And what we would do is we would put a really, really strong, like one-on-one -on -one defender against them. And we would put our strongest in-air defender against someone else. And that in-air defender was used to go look and help in that person went deep so we could actually sandwich them. Because if it was a one-on-one -on -one matchup, our best in-air person wasn't, it wasn't a 50-50 shot at that point. It was kind of more 60-40 because the other person was on offense and usually ties go to the person who can see this person in the offense. So we actually put our best in air defender on someone else being able to look to go help rather than being able to um, isolate our best person in a 1v1 matchup. So that's an example of, in that case, we looked at personnel and then being able to help off the side or is there deep game um, coming from someone who is a phenomenal thrower so like being able to put a really active mark on that person straight up to like force them to reach wider than they want to be able to throw because then you're going to have opportunities. If they're not in their stance in terms of what they're comfortable throwing and you can get them to just throw a little bit farther than that stance, then you're going to win and they're going to start to like turn the disc over. It's not going to go directly on point and you'll have opportunities to take them out of that option. So hopefully that helps. So it depends. Um, okay, any other questions? Uh, some good footage. Oh, everyone read that comment. Some good footage of this uh, with Andrew Lusden on Ben Wayne's the 2006 Men's Club Nationals. Um, so yeah, it's a good time. Are you ready to talk about utilizing your players, utilizing your whole team? Yeah. All right, let's talk about it. Um, so one of the things I really like to think about when I want to utilize my whole team is being able to teach my athletes and empower my athletes to learn how to make adjustments for themselves. If you are a coach and you are, or a captain and you are programming robots, you're going to have spent so much time having to program them and make adjustments for themselves. If they can learn how to do it actively themselves and learn what their strengths are as a defender, and learn how to identify strengths in another person and understand the relationship between those things. So how can I, my strength, be able to neutralize that person's strength? Um, for instance, one of my strengths is I have a very good mark. And so sometimes I would be put on someone that is way taller than me um, because I can force them to go under and I could create opportunities with my mark. And I would be able to force them to throw out like a little bit farther than they want into a situation that like we wouldn't want. I could identify offenses quickly so I would know kind of what's happening behind me. Um, so that my strength of my mark, I would put that player into those situations to create opportunities. Um, so being able to teach other players how to do that, identify their own strengths, which is really great because then if they're having trouble in a game, if you can tell them like, what are the things you do well go back to those things, they'll start to play better. Um, and so then being able to then identify strengths in other players and also them to start build that Rolodex. If they go and say, oh, I'm matching up against someone that is like so-and-so on our team, be like, you've guarded them every day at practice. It's just like that, go guard them again. And they settle in and they find that hunger to go work hard. Um, so one, teaching how to identify empower strengths in themselves, and then also to learn how to identify strengths in others, and then the relationship between those two, that's how you can start utilizing your players. And then they can start identifying matchups for themselves. So you're not standing on the line matching up all seven. You can start to say, start identifying who you're gonna take in this game. 
and make goals for the team that in the first couple tournaments that that to be able to do that that's something um i think that we did really well this year was to empower our athletes to do that so that as we grew throughout each tournament each tournament we got better at more quickly being able to identify our matchups and that actually came from the players which is really helpful as a coach so that you can focus on bigger picture things instead of just on the little things and you can start to think who the certain players are and give uh, matchups to those people instead of having to do it for all of your entire team um next talking about teaching space um so one of the things I like to do is talk about almost every offense, no matter what they run, there's three spaces that teams try to attack. There's the under, there's the deep, and there's the break side. These boxes can shift, and also the priorities of these boxes can shift. Some teams might prioritize the deep space, and then they look for the under, and then they look for the break. Some teams might actually prioritize getting into the break lane first, and then they look to go somewhere else. So if you talk about it in terms of these spaces, kind of like open side under deep and this break side space, you can actually start to like then be able to ask players being like, well, where is this space on the field? Where are they trying to attack? And start to teach it in terms of this. When I um, coached high school, one of the things I would do is I would stop play and I would have all the athletes close their eyes and I would have them all point to where the priority space is right now because the disc would be in a new position, a like their player would be in a random position and in stopping play and having them identify where like, where is the biggest threat of space right now? Because one, it hopefully then taught offensive players that they should leave that space open. And then it hopefully showed defensive players that this is the space that's going to be attacked next. So I have to be heads up for it and being able to stop play and identify that's something that is a skill and teaching your players how to do that then causes them to be more dynamic. And then in games, you could be like this team, we prioritize this space. This team does not, this team prioritizes this space. So we need to make adjustments to move. So thinking about it as the big field is really important. Second, is actually thinking about the 1v1 matchup. So how I teach this is I like to think about if this is a person and you're a bird, like looking down the person, if you kind of make crosshairs on them, these are the different spaces. This is, um, let's say there's a force flick. This is open side deep, this is open side under, and this is break side um, under, and then this is break side deep. And so being able to tell your athletes, you need to dictate that you are taking something away. There is something that this person cannot go to. This athlete has no chance of getting there. And so let's say they choose the uh, open side deep with their body positioning that they're taking away this quadrant. They are not gonna win that. What is the space then you are making hard? And it's usually one of the spaces right next to that quadrant. So they need to make this underside open hard. It's not good enough to just be able to shut down one space. You need to make their life hell and then tell them to go somewhere else. You can do the same thing with shutting down the open side under. Maybe you're, you're saying you can't go here and make the deep hard, or maybe some teams prioritize that slashing cut that we talked about where they push to the open side. And so you're prioritizing taking away this open side under until you know that this is actually the look they want. And you position and teach your athletes to orbit and say you actually when they get into this side you're in this quadrant and you're not letting them come back our goal defining success is if we can pin them on the sideline if we can get them to the sideline they can't open up this space and that is our goal that is success for this team is they don't get open side unders in the middle of the field you push them wide and when they try to come back we are standing there and we're not letting them go and if i just taught being able to teach this kind of ability to kind of like talk to different spaces, I'm able to then on the field be able to talk to my players and say, this is what they're trying to do. I want to put your body here. You are denying this space and success is pinning them on the sideline. And defining success for players really helps them because if they go, well, they caught the disc and be like, did they catch it in a bad spot? Did you put them somewhere they didn't want to be? 
And if you did that, that's awesome. And so like defining success is get them on the sideline. We want to put them in a really tight window, but for some teams, putting teams on a sideline and letting them work down the open side is their strength. So that's why it's nice to be able to be dynamic. Um, I have, I could probably do a whole talk on how I teach this in terms of drills I do for defense and like how I teach the footwork for this, how um, I teach um, the overall space, that kind of stuff. But for now, I kind of just wanted to talk about teaching your players to not just think about how to shut down the open side, but think about what um, you're actually saying no to and what you're making hard. And so that way, a lot of the times when someone comes off the field, I'll ask them um, if we weren't having a team defense, like to say, learn your matchup, make like learn what they're trying to do and make your own assessment of if you're going to guard the unders or the deeps, I'll say, well, what were you taking away? And it's surprising how many athletes will say, uh, I don't know. And be like, well, first, the next point you go on, do that. And then I can work with you on like how to make the other one hard and get them to start thinking that way. Um, we had a question that says, uh, do you have thoughts about mimicking some big matchups at your own team practices and best ways to facilitate that? Um, yes, I think that's like super important, especially going into tournaments with like regionals or doing stuff like that. The best way that I have found to facilitate that is actually asking uh, local players to come in and scrimmage your team. I find that that is a really dynamic way. Um, we actually, uh, when I coach a different team, we would ask players to come in and we asked them all that year, we had a really big kind of like mental drain against Oregon. And so we actually asked all of them to wear green. So that way, and like try to wear Oregon stuff if they had any. And so that way it was just like looking across the field and having to like specifically do that, like was something to facilitate yeah. that big movement. Um, to be able to facilitate that idea. Um, also, sometimes uh, maybe you don't have that type of player at your practice. You maybe just invite guest players, one or two, to play. Or potentially, if you're a coach, jump in and play and try to mimic some of what those players do, um, if you feel comfortable doing that. But utilize the resources of your community to help facilitate those types of things. Um, I find that easier than maybe trying to teach a player to do what's not comfortable to them, um, depending on where you are in season. Um, da, 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 da. Um, I had one other thing I wanted to talk about. Oh, talking about building a Swiss army knife of defenses. So thinking about um, how you're going to, instead of thinking about saying, we're gonna have these eight defenses and they all have like a theme name about Pirates of the Caribbean or something like that. And every player has to know all eight. I like to think about that I have almost types of defenses like I like to run up front with the handlers, types of defenses that I like to run in the backfield and how different ways that I can mix and match those things. And so that way I actually have a Swiss army knife um, or almost just like the ability to kind of mix and match and become really dynamic and have what I need rather than just being and just being kind of okay we're running pirate now and those players have to like think about it they've only run it a couple times but if you say we're running this up front and they've run a type of sag in the lanes like a bunch of times they're really comfortable with that and you usually have the similar players running that types of things Maybe you have a sag in the lane where you call it a, you know, a flash where you tell them to be in that space and then, but it's only there for a second and you want the player to, once the thrower is recognizing that you're there, you're already closing back on the handler. So it's almost like you're a magician. You're in the space they want to look and by the time they look for who's poached, you're there again. You're in two places at once. If you're on a team, that's like good for a team that's like looking downfield and they're looking to move it real fast you can slow down their handler, uh, handler movement that way. But if you're looking at a team that just wants to huck and they're just looking down the field regardless, you might just want to sit players there and tell them to be big, um, depending on that. Um, so, yeah. So building a Swiss Army knife, building uh, ultimate IQ in your athletes rather than robots, 
teaching your players how to identify strengths and then like being able to utilize people in your community so that way players have a comfort level or within your own practice guarding a particular type of player and building that rolodex now all of a sudden you can start to identify what are the strengths of my team what is my team good at um because it won't like you might love to have a forced middle defense if your team can't run forced middle don't fight it think about what their strengths are what they can do um, a great example from this past season that i'm like super proud um, of danger doing is we were facing a team that had a fast break offense and we told them that they need to get deeper than their players well our o trending line came up with a junk defense on their own. I don't even know what it was. It was just complete trust and it was very successful for them. They owned it themselves. They were ability, they understood that they needed to get deeper than players to be able to force them to throw a lot of passes. Our defensive line was very, our deep trending players were very, very strong in their matchups and they were able to then grind out those points. And so if you looked at the game, our O trending went on and played a junk and our D trenders went on and played matchup and it became really hard to coach against us and for that offensive team to make adjustments because they didn't know what they were gonna see. Were they gonna see a junky look in space? Were they gonna have tight matchups where there was help deep off the back? They, like, they weren't able to adjust and they were throwing into opportunities for us to get these. I was like super proud of them for that, yeah. Okay, so let's see what questions came in. Uh, da, 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 da. I follow how to redefine success on defense. Um, offense is hard to disassociate with scoring a goal. How can redefine success on offense even when we don't score? Um, so one of my favorite scrimmages to play is a scrimmage where athletes get points for passes they complete. Uh, so I've done it where it's like, you have a mini field and you're playing 3v3, 4v4, and every completed pass is a point. And if you score, possession changes. So uh, one team that I had, they were super smart and they were like, oh, well, we'll force them deep. And so the team threw it. It was a completion, um, got one point. And then the other team just threw, just threw and caught with each other. They went backwards. They did everything. And we redefined success as being able to hit open players. And I think that team got 50 points or something in that just like one point. And I had the other team come up to me and they're like, well, we didn't even get a chance to get the ball and try again being like, well, that's ultimate. You give up the disc, you don't get it back. And that was a really eye-opening thing for those players. And we've done it to where um, there's this other drill that I like, I call it ping pong. So you take, um, your end zone. So let's say you've set up your field for practice. You take your end zone. So it's 20 yards by 40 yards and you just put a line of cones down the middle. And so every time that you complete a catch, it's a point. And every time you cross the center line, it's two points. And so it tries to encourage this idea of like switching the field gets you more points. And it's just as many as passes as you can get in a minute and a half. And it is exhausting. And it is hard to play defense. There's so much space and it teaches people to just throw things out to space because it's 4v4 and there's a lot of room. Um, and you start to get athletes to just think us having possession during this minute and a half is two minutes means the other team doesn't get it. That's success. That's something that being able to honor the ball, honor possession and think about that as success is something that how I like to coach my teams. So hopefully that's how you can redefine success. Um, how do you go about finding D-line chemistry over the course of a season? Oh God, I'm really bad at scrolling. Um, what are skills and traits of a defender on one of your D-line? Uh, skills, traits a defender on one of your D-lines needs to have. Um, so I would say being able to be on a D-line, you, um, I think, Ooh, this is hard. Let me think about it. Because my initial gut reaction is tenacity. Uh, you have to have a love of kind of making someone's life hell to be a D-line player because you might not get the disc. You might get one opportunity for a chance to go to the end zone in an entire game. But if you knew that you made someone's life 
really hard for that 90 minutes, that is something that like is success for you and you're excited about that makes a great D line player in my mind. Um, that kind of want and drive to define success that way, because it can get really exhausting if you're defining success on assists and goals. And I would say if you find a player that defines success that way, to work with them about maybe redefining what their strengths are, because not always, it might not be your game and you can have a really successful game and never throw a score or never catch a goal. And you did all the right things to get your team to do that. Um, let's see. Something else that um, a skill and a trade a defender has to have is the ability to understand what their strengths are as a defender. And every single person has one. And every, in my ability, there is someone that you can neutralize on the other team. There's something that you do really well that can neutralize someone else on the other team. Um, that might, if you're playing maybe like where there's a big disparity of against athleticism, maybe you have to play like zones or do something else. But that means that maybe your ultimate IQ is something that is your strength and where you then like learn how to like be able to defend against someone else. So I really think everyone can be a good D-line player. So maybe that's just my whole win-win mentality. Do you have formal ways of soliciting and or recording players' Rolodex observations? Um, that's a great question. That's something that I definitely want to build. I've thought about, I've heard other coaches kind of like take, um, make GIFs of players in terms of their release points and stuff so they can be able to like share that. Um, but a lot of it I think is experience. So telling players to guard different types of players at practice because they might have to guard them um, in games or maybe you will guard someone who's really good in the air who has a really great around backhand. Go guard someone with an around backhand because maybe our person who's really great in the air has a really great flick hook. So being able to kind of catalog and think about what am I able to do? Can I identify? Um, one of the things that um, my co-coaches did was they brought index cards to practice and had the players actually write down and spend time talking about it. It was a really great practice that I thought they led really, really well where like you wrote down kind of what your person did and, and you like came back to it. So I thought that was a really dynamic practice that took players and taught them how to have that mentality. And the practice moved really slow. There wasn't a lot of running, but I thought it really, really helped us go into our tournaments, be able to play good defense because the athletes were able to empower for themselves. So you can talk to maybe some of the other pit players about it, but I loved that practice. I thought it was run really well by my coaches. Um, can you give some examples of the downfield D options for the Swiss army knife? Yeah, I can do that. I think I talked about some of them. Um, so you can think about if they have three handlers across, you can have like a straight up mark in the middle with two sags in the lane. You can do something like that. You can talk about that. Um, you can have that. You can do this where this is flashy, where they flash into the lane and they come back. Talked about that. You can talk about where um, you sag in the lane unless it's a particular player and then that person is always guarded um, person no matter where the disc goes. So it's like sag in the lane because this is the person that we're trying to neutralize. And then when it goes to someone else, this person never leaves them and they, it stays. And so if they go somewhere else, then we're tight. We're only sagging on a particular player. Um, downfield, you can think about having just like normal deep two wings and an under, um, you can th think about having, talking about if there's a lane, kind of having a deep and an under and having these two people person up over here. Um, some of the stuff I like to think about. So um, talking about forcing backhand or flick straight up. Straight, and a lot of the times when I talk about um, marks, especially straight up, I like to make defenses that I call hand blocks and be like, we're going to go straight up and you're going for the hand block, which means that you are one step away because we don't want to make fouls. And it really encourages athletes to shuffle harder, being able to go over every disc, be really dynamic. Um, 
can because if it's 10 seconds of really, really chaotic, aggressive marking, and aggressive marking meaning from a distance away, so it's not fouling, it really kind of makes people feel uncomfortable. And if you're making someone feel uncomfortable, usually they are gonna mess up. Um, that sounds really awkward, but it's true. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, how do you evaluate whether it is the student's best interest to continue to sharpen or dull part of your army knife or throw it out? Um, really, you can kind of, um, so I'm an empath, so I can really feel when my athletes are excited about a particular defense. And if you, people are excited about running something, you can build upon that and they want to like make it successful. And if people are kind of like, like really just like against it, you have to think to yourself, is it worth it? Do I really need this? Is there another way that I can achieve the same goal of disruption in something else? And maybe they'll get more excited about that. And testing that out at practices, testing that out at scrimmages against people in the community. That's ways that I found to do that. Um, yes, I can explain the ping pong drill again at the end. And then, all right, so we're getting close to the end of time. Um, okay, how do we, how do we approach making in-game adjustments for offense on teams I've been on in general consensus on offense is to go back to, let's just play our game and focus on us rather than make in-game adjustments. Um, so that's great. Um, that's where I really go back to the menu that I talked about. Um, because it's like, let's play like us. What is us? How can you define us? And if you can't define us and talk about what we do, and also to say, let's be us, like, well, what part of us is not going well right now? I totally agree with that. Let's just be us. But which part of us do we need to focus on? Do we need to, right now, there's a really big crosswind that we're like, struggling with. So let's really focus on switching the field and high siding. That's something that's us. Is it something where we're looking, the other team's doing a great job kind of poaching in the deep space? Well, you know what? Uh, we're also really good at working the unders. We're great at attacking this lane or like looking into our handler set. So being able to look at what part of us is the thing that you can settle into and picking one thing, because if you're looking to adjust everything, it feels overwhelming and it feels like it's a huge mountain to climb. But if you break it down and be like, let's just go and get a little bit further right now, get a little bit closer to us, that feels doable. And then you can define success even if you get scored on again, be like, hey, that was closer. Let's go a little bit further. And it also keeps spirits up because so much of how we can be successful is our mental game. Okay. It is 7.59. Um, Christy, how does this work? If I have more questions and I feel bad I didn't get to everyone's. Did I get to everyone's? I did. Okay. So Christy told me, do you want to do it? I don't care. Okay. Christy told me that if you all want to, um, right now, Pittsburgh Ultimate is putting together these um, talks. So if you're able to, and you would like to uh, support Pittsburgh Ultimate, if you could donate to, um, that would be nice. If you just wanted to come out and hang out, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate you listening. I will copy and paste kind of the donations in there that helps keep Pittsburgh Ultimate going. and being able to do more of these types of things um and they have helped our community a bunch so i appreciate them i appreciate them giving me the opportunity to speak here today so um thank you christy for your hard work and donate if you want to but if not thank you again so much and if you ever want to talk to me about coaching i love talking about this stuff so please um feel free to reach out in whatever ways um my dog's Instagram is at Kyo, Prince of Pittsburgh. DM him there. <laughs> There's also sessions pretty much daily on this channel, and they're um, accruing as we go. So if you're interested in stopping by any other ones, feel free. Uh, I just put the link to the rest of the schedule in the chat. Yay. OK. I know someone wanted the ping pong thing. Can I explain that one more time? OK. Ping pong game. That's it. So if all the rest of you want to go, you can, or you can just listen to me talk about this again. So if you've set up a field for your practice, so you have like cones for your end zone, you put like little um, half disc cones down the middle. 
and you just um, go for a time, it's 4v4, um, a minute and a half is very exhausting. So um, we've done two minutes before it, as a conditioning thing. It's really hard. So you play 4v4 in here, and it's just for time. You count every successful pass. If player one throws a player two and it's successful, that's one point. If they sort of throw a player three, that's two points. Then they throw again and they throw across this line. It would be four plus another one five because they crossed. If they keep passing it past this line, it's plus two every single time. And you just have the sideline counting the points. So on every catch, they're like one, two, three, they cross the line five, they throw again six, they cross the line eight, and you just count how many tier can your team get in a minute and a half. And it's really fun to actually make goals to say, can we beat 42? As a, like, can you do that? And you almost have like max. I did this with, uh, I coached Small Batch, which is a women's club team in Colorado. And we had um, in our two minutes, I think 42 was our max. Um, so, and it's really nice because a lot of the times um, it teaches people to just hit the open person and throw to space. And if you kind of get stuck in this back corner, if someone's hanging out over here, like throwing a long pass to this space to then switch the field um, works really well. We're being able to kind of just like pop or to pop promotion throw. We actually use this ping pong drill because we didn't have time to teach zone offense and we just used this instead and it was really great. So yeah, that's everything. Okay. Bye everyone. Thank you for listening.